Welcome everyone. We are so excited to have you join us for our third Tree Talks in the wake of progress and a path forward with internationally recognized photographer, Edward Bertinsky. I'm Britt Biedenbender and I'm the Financing Change Director for Canopy and I'm coming to you from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And I want to acknowledge that we are hosted on the lands of the Wampanoag people and recognize their enduring presence on this land. Before we get started, let's run through some housekeeping bits that you will notice uh, mentioned on the opening slide. First of all, communication will take place in the Q&A section. So if you have a technical issue or want to ask questions during the question and answer session or just want to comment, please do so in the Q&A. If you have video issues and you need to call into the webinar, there's also a local number to connect to the event audio with your phone. That number is also has also been posted in the Q&A. And again, if you have any questions, technical concerns, please put them in the Q&A. If you'd like to make sure that you're seeing the speakers, please switch your view to speaker view. Joining us today are Nicole Rycroft, founder and executive director of Canopy and recent recipient of the Meritorious Service Cross of Canada and our very special guest, acclaimed photographer, Edward Bertinsky. Edward is regarded as one of the world's most accomplished contemporary photographers. His iconic photographic depictions of global industrial landscapes represent over 40 years of his dedication to bearing witness to the impact of humans on the planet. His photographs are included in the collections of over 60 major museums around the world. And from now until July 17th, you can engage yourself in Mr. Bertinsky's epic immersive experience in the wake of progress taking place at the Canadian Opera Theatre in Toronto. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you enjoy today's tree talk. Nicole. Thanks, Britt. Um, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. As Britt mentioned, I'm Nicole Rycroft and Canopy's founder and executive director. And, and normally I'm based in on the west coast of Canada uh, and would be speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish First Nations. Uh, but today I'm joining you from London uh, in the UK. Uh, for those of you who are new to Canopy, just a quick introduction. We're a solutions-driven not-for-profit organization. We work to protect the world's forests, species and climate and help advance frontline community rights. And we do that by harnessing the purchasing influence of more than 800 corporate customers of the forest products industry. So companies that use a lot of paper, a lot of paper packaging, and a lot of wood-based fabrics like Viscos. And we work with these companies like H&M, LVMH, Penguin Random House to transform unsustainable supply chains and catalyze the commercial scale production of next-gen solutions. Uh, to ultimately conserve forest ecosystems on the ground. We've been doing a lot of work in recent years within the fashion and the packaging supply chains, historically known for greening the Harry Potter book series. And we have hundreds of people uh, slated to join us today from around the world. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for sharing your evenings, the wee hours of your morning, um, as well as afternoon. And I'm particularly excited about this conversation um, because like many of you, I'm a huge fan of Ed's work. I've been a long time admirer. Um, but Ed, you and I only spoke for the first time last year um, when Canopy was urging the BC government to stop the logging of BC's iconic old growth forest. And, and so thank you for lending your name and support to that particular campaign. Um, but I think one of the things that I particularly enjoy about your work is your incredible ability to lure us in with those disconcertingly beautiful images uh, to then only later realize that these are the scars that are left from industrial activity um, and how that helps trigger a kind of like both an internal dialogue as well as a broader societal dialogue around the impacts and practices. Um, and Britt didn't mention, but of course I'd be remiss without mentioning, Ed is the winner of a TED Prize, uh, outstanding contribution of, uh, to photography with the Sony World Photography uh, Awards and is an officer of the Order of Canada amongst uh, many accolades for generally being an outstanding human being. So Ed, welcome, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for that, Nicole. It's great to be here and uh, to help you in such a, a worthy cause, which is uh, to uh, pay attention to those forests that still exist and that biodiversity that is locked in those forests that needs to be protected at all costs. So 
congratulations to you and your team to, 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 to be at the front lines of that battle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're just going to roll right in and it would be remiss of us to um, you know, have a conversation with you without actually also having it be accompanied by the incredible uh, and iconic uh, images that you've taken. So let's start off with, um, I guess, what's at the heart of Canopy's work, um, which is the protection of forests. Uh, and I read somewhere that, you know, when we first went into lockdown, that you uh, actually retreated uh, to uh, part of Ontario and spent time really close uh, to forest ecosystems. So can you maybe speak a little bit about that being kind of like your refuge during that time and perhaps even share your first memory of being in a forest? <clears throat> well, I mean, uh, for um, us Canadians, um, we've been blessed with uh, a lot of forest um, and uh, not to be taken for granted. In fact, you know, like of, of the kind of ancient primal forests, I think on Southern Ontario only has less than 1% of the original pine stands. Uh, and then somewhere outside of Tobogamy, there's this kind of uh, little known area that has still never been felled. And it still is what you would experience if you were a First Nations walking through Southern Ontario or pre-First Nations and you were just uh, a deer walking through, this would be the forest you'd be experiencing. So we don't have a lot of that primal forest, but we did have a lot of forest, nonetheless, secondary growth. And I grew up in that secondary growth. And my father was a real outdoors person. So we used to go mushroom picking in the fall. So that's my very earliest recollections of trying to stay close enough to him so I don't get lost. Getting lost was some part of the process of mushroom picking and, and having the kind did of he panic leave, attack. Did he have breadcrumbs in his pocket by chance? No, but oftentimes he would, he would see how far I'd go. He'd be watching me. And, he'd, and then when he saw a panic set in, he'd come and get me. Uh, just to remind <laughs> me that he needs to stick close to him. Um, and to feel the fear of being lost in the forest. But, but I, but I um, had that kind of um, early experience with what is kind of this chaotic uh, forest floor. It's, 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 it's a detail that it, we don't think about. It's kind of almost silly to mention it, but when we live in cities, we, mm -hmm. we, we, we have finished surfaces, whether it's concrete roads or brick walls or glass or mirrors or signage, right. um, you know, the exterior of cars, that is our surface. But when you enter a forest, it, it goes into a whole other level of complexity and depth. And I was always fascinated with that. And my earliest um, photography, I used to go and I just loved taking pictures and trying to be in that third dimensional space of the forest. But yet, if I stood in a very particular spot, all of a sudden it would become a, an, an image, something worthy of kind of consideration. And, and it would be like this this hiving out order out of chaos and um and to me that was a real kind of early lesson in how to organize space how to how to really see through all of that and find that you know when i stand here with the light at a certain time of day with it in a certain position to where i stand all of a sudden this thing that looks sort of mundane becomes magical and um so my love of um, of all of that, you know, really is 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 because I I, lo I love making art. I love I've always made things, whether I painted them or photographed them, and and going to the image that you're showing right now, um, you know, I, I, it's kind of bookends in the wake of progress as well because I started with the forest and then somehow because of COVID, I had completely um, a book schedule. I was supposed to be in Ethiopia photographing kind of China's globalization and march into Africa, in particular into Ethiopia. And I was looking at industry uh, there and the Belt and Road Initiative that they were unfolding mm -hmm. at that time. So I was supposed to be doing that in April, uh, um, but as we all know, by you know late February, everything was locking down. By March, everything was locked down. So I decamped up north. Uh, I've been up around this area, around Georgian Bay, around Collingwood. I've had a property there since 1985. And, we planted over 3,000 trees there. There are now 40 foot high trees. Wow. Um, and, uh, but I was, I was there and I said, I'm gonna start using th that this time and, and this new camera that I bought 
um, which is the super high resolution camera that I was going to take to, to Africa. And I just started photographing in my neighborhood, going back to my roots, going back to this kind of me camera and the landscape. And it was something sort of like really refreshing. It was so, because my career and my kind of shoots got more and more complex with drone operators and I have augmented reality teams and I have a film crew off and so the film Anthropocene and Human Epoch. You know, when we went to Russia, we had um, a crew of 12 people that we brought in and then we had an extra five people that we would hire on location. So we were walking around as 20 people. So right. just me, camera and landscape were was something very refreshing and something very back to earth and and back to just looking at the complexity of nature and just being kind of in its simplicity but also uh being struck and 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 awed by that complexity and maybe what i'm looking at here is what is enduring and what is our own fabric of our own lives the the, the structure there is a structure of our neural nets of our vascular systems and our nervous systems, but there it is for all to see as an external system keeping, you know, the, the life of a forest alive. I love, I, I love the, um, conceptually the, you know, how something can look rather mundane, but when you capture it from the right angle, or if you pay close enough attention, the kind of the, the magic that's in, inherent to that. Uh, the complexity of ecosystems kind of really comes to life and just I, I, a couple of weekends ago here in London went for a walk with a, a naturalist walk and I think we covered probably uh, 120 meters in three hours but all of the orchids and different kind of small kind of microflora uh, that became apparent with just being attentive uh, was really quite magical. Um, so I, I really, I really appreciate kind of the the viewscape. And I, I guess especially when you were a child and you're much closer to the kind of the understory at that point. When when did you get your first camera and and start taking photographs? Uh, I got my first camera when I was 11. Oh, okay. And I was kind of fortunate in that um, back then, which uh, when I was 11, that would have been 1966. So back then film film was precious and and you know you didn't take the family camera and run around and take pictures of the table legs or anything like that because <laughs> they say hey wait you're or wasting dessert. or dessert you're wasting you're wasting film you know it has to be of the family or some event or blah 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 it was a special events kind of tool whereas um, you know unlike today with an iPhone no one thinks twice about taking a picture that was not the case when I grew up. But I would, what came with it was this um, bulk loader when we bought the, the, this dark room and all the stuff in it from a widower whose husband was a avid amateur photographer. But in there was a bunch of cameras, but it was all these bulk loaders and cassettes. So I can go and load 36 images into the cassette. And there was like 300 foot rolls. And each one of those was 20 rolls of 36. So I had like 60 rolls of black and white film, Tri-X at the time. Wow. I could just run around and peel off a roll whenever I felt like it. So it was like an iPhone for me. You know, I could just go and just have fun with it and just see. And actually, the first pictures I ever took were going outside. It was wintertime and it was my dog, Tippy. And I would just I just took a whole roll because I wanted to see how the whole process worked. I wanted to process the film. I wanted to make a print, made a contact sheet. And then that night I'm looking at a contact sheet with 36 pictures of my dog and I'm trying to pick the one. The one, the one that you know stands out of all the other 36. Little did I know that I was going to spend a good part of my life doing that, looking at a whole right. bunch of ones that I took and picking the one that really came came to bear as the best one. But there I was as a, as a very naive little kid, just curious about it. Um, but I've always shot a lot of you know when I when I was interested in something, I would shoot five or six or seven or eight or nine, ten pictures sometimes because I didn't care about the film, it didn't, it was, I just go roll up another bunch of film. Uh, and, and I would then realize that in there, in those eight or nine variants, there's always one that seemed to like snap together and have that ability to transcend the mundane. And yeah. that became a real, like, uh, just a life experience. It wasn't anybody taught me that. I, I, I saw it, I, 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 I was able to kind of intuitively realize that don't just take one take a lot take a bunch move around a bit find it take it at different times look at it different, different angle. That, yeah. Right. yeah yeah 
So Very I think nice. that, and that's the difference between, I think, you know, uh, a picture being kind of, ah, you know, to something that has the ability to capture your imagination. Mm -hmm. And transport. Um, so this leads quite nicely into the next uh, question, which, you know, oftentimes we have secured its roots to where life leads us. But at the start of your career, I think you were wanting to become a nature or landscape photographer. Um, but somewhere along the line, you kind of changed your focus from nature to more of the manufactured landscape. Can you share a little bit about what kind of triggered that sort of deviation in path? Well, there's a couple of a couple of things ha happened. One, I was uh, raised in a, a kind of an industrial town. It was a GM town. And GM was the primary employer at the time. That's where my father worked. And there were uh, 11,000 people working for GM in a town of 100,000 people. So uh, one in 10 people actually were employed by, by actually today it's less than 2,000. So it was like the heyday of, uh, of General Motors uh, in, in, that, in that city. So I got to see you know, industry inside. Um, I got to work there. Um, and I, I ended up having, because my, my father passed away when I was quite young. So I had to put myself through school. Uh, something I, 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 I dare say that, you know, kids today would have a hard time with tuition and rents and everything to put themselves through school. But back then, you know, in, in, in the mid seventies, you know, my, my tuition for university was $250 a term. You know, and and uh, and uh, and a rent splitting three ways in a three bedroom apartment with some friends would cost me one hundred and fifty dollars a month. So I could even earn that much. You know, I mean, wages were still around ten dollars an hour back then in a factory. So I was able to earn enough money to actually put myself through school. I think something that would be very hard for 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 young people to do today. But in doing that. I went to work in mines. I went to work in the biggest industry I could find. And while putting myself through photography school, and I was interested in doing landscape, but then it occurred to me that there was, uh, that if I wanted to be doing something meaningful and for my time, if I wanted to embed something uh, of the world that I saw unfolding in front of me and to somehow build that meaningful piece into my work, is that rather than just focus on the unspoiled, pristine landscape, that, that I should look at how that landscape is actually being pushed back. What is pushing it back? How is it, you know, so what is, um, what is putting that landscape at risk? And I realized it's obviously humans, it's deforestation, it's agriculture, it's, it's, it's resource extraction, it's mining, it's urban sprawl, it's infrastructure, it's highways, it's bridges. So I realized that, and, and back in the early 80s, I was looking at the graphs and I was at university and they're saying, we're in a population explosion. We're now three point something billion and we're moving to eight, maybe 10 billion people. And there's just a hockey stick, you know, it's taken us this long to get to a billion, you know, 1800, you know, and 50, we get to 1 billion. Now we get the next billion is like 50 years. And then the next, you know, Six yeah. billion is my lifetime. Yeah. So I realized that we were in this hockey stick. That, that, and I also saw the scale of what, of, of what it would look like in 1980. And I said, you know, if I pursue this idea, I will be writing this kind of unprecedented human experiment of, of, of technological growth on a scale that I couldn't imagine that that in that growth that we what I was looking at with camera in the mining industry and all of those places were, you know, copper, nickel, iron ore was easily accessible through open pit mines, that the, that this easy access will diminish as we take more and more, we'll have to go further and further. And that land of plenty, in my estimation, will end up being the land of scarcity. Yeah, and maybe we can go to the next image, which is from my homeland, uh, but uh, is, and I think what you're speaking of there really speaks to progress, right? Like, and, and progress is always positioned as positive, profitable, advancing, um, but from an environmental perspective, uh, it does, it leads to these kind of landscapes that were once, or el natural elements that were once in abundance, becoming landscapes uh, or resources of, of scarcity. And so maybe if you can share a little bit about what you make of that double-edged sword 
uh, of progress? Well, it, it, you know, yes, and on the one hand, and, and I think what's interesting and what's important, and especially with coming out and showing this piece now in Toronto and showing it at the square in the wake of progress, it, it, it's, a, it's interesting that no matter how, how well you try to live, we're all implicated on some level. So, so there isn't anybody I think that can live a pure life and saying, I'm not a problem. We get on jets, we, tra we, we travel, we have families. We, we have we, cell phones. Yeah, we have a grocery store mm -hmm. with a limited place where we can get our food and it's packaged in certain ways. And so we all, we all you know, we're all kind of caught in this notion of progress. And, and, and it, it is this double-edged sword. It's a dilemma. It's like we want it. We want a decent life. We want a life for a decent life for ourselves. And we want, and if we have children, we want a great life for them too. And we want our friends, see our friends prosper and colleagues to do well. And so there is this, we want an economy. I mean, you know, economy, no matter what, I've seen it happen before. Back in, you know, 2006 and seven, and that, that was around the time I won the TED Prize. And just afterwards, Al Gore came out with the inconvenient truth. The environment was on the top notch rung of everybody's mind. The economy was still doing great. All of a sudden, 08 hits and, and the environment ends up on the 10th rung. The economy's on the first rung. And you know, all the things associated with that and, and, and stimulating the environment and stimulating the economy and getting that up and running again. Un unemployment, people's losing their homes. And you can see how that becomes. A, a, a kind of a, an issue that overwhelms and, and becomes front and center and front page and, and when people are suffering at that level. So in many ways, it's very hard to, ha and I saw the environment, you know, get knocked off its pedestal at that time, uh, which was, I think, actually a critical time. Had, you know, we really jumped in and really, you know, pushed back carbon emissions at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, we're now almost, you know, 15 years later, those are 15 precious years that we lost. And now we're back up again, but now we're watching the economy teetering as well. So I'm, you know, waiting with anxious, with, with anxiety, is, is this going to happen again? Does it get knocked off? Well, if but, I can, if I can allay some of your fears, some of our experience, because we experienced in 2008, kind of sustainability getting kind of put over on a side burner. Um, but with COVID and, and the market instability uh, that has come with it, uh, it's been really encouraging, actually, that, you know, brands that were leaders, sustainability has just moved, climate action, biodiversity action has moved further up uh, their priority stack. And for those that were perhaps slower to move on uh, climate and biodiversity action, uh, it's actually elevated as a priority. There's just, I think, a recognition that there are only so many disruptions like those created by COVID, that the economy, that businesses can withstand and that climate change promises to dwarf uh, the impact of COVID. So I don't know if that makes you feel any better. That's, but that's, a little bit, that's good, it's good to hear. And I know, I know that at ESG, and uh, there's a lot of movement in, in you know, both companies and industry and even governments uh, recognizing that uh, we are now at a very, very important threshold. And, and that we need to hold, we can't cross that threshold. There's too, too, there's too much risk uh, in, in crossing over. Yeah, maybe we can yeah, move to the next image, which is of uh, one of my chosen home as opposed to my homeland. Um, so, Ed, as you know, because this is kind of where we had our first kind of direct point of contact, Canopy has worked to protect BC's old growth forests for many years now. Um, including work alongside of other NGOs, uh, Indigenous nations, to ensure that all of BC's iconic old growth forests are permanently taken off the cutting block and conserved in a way that helps support human well-being, as well as the ecological needs of the landscape. Now, a couple of years ago, you did a series of photographs um, in and kind of around Vancouver Island. So what brought you to, Van to BC at that time? What was the inspiration for you in doing the, the series? Well, we, uh, I, I worked with um, a, a several collaborators. Uh, there are a couple uh, in life and, and in work, uh, Nick, Nick DePonce and, and Jennifer Bachewell. And we were working on a project called the Anthropocene Project. Uh, uh, and the film was called Anthropocene, the Human Epoch. 
uh, and it's and it releases a film in, in, in 2018. And what we wanted to do is because when you get into these difficult subjects, you know, like what are we doing to the planet, and you know, and that we were loading the you know the exhibition and the film with human activity that that has a detrimental effect on on, on nature, on biodiversity, on on you know on the atmosphere, uh, on all those things, and and it, it, there is a real danger you know, uh, of the Cassandra complex or a real danger of just, you know, making everybody feel like, oh, why bother? You know, we're, we're at the, uh, right. you know, it's all, it's all, it's, it's all kind of too late. It's all for naught. You know, I'm just going to go back and, you know, pull my horns in and go and live my life in, in peace. And I, I can't be, you know, I can't, I can't look at this. So, so that is an, a danger as, you know, uh, working in this, in this subject matter is that you don't want to, you know, remove hope as yeah. part, of, part of the equation. So, so what we started ta talking about and what we wanted to do and what I wanted to do as well, even in my water um, project that I did earlier, is to show that, you know, uh, there is biodiversity still with us. We do have all the complexity still in our midst. It's not guaranteed, and we need to understand it. We need to do what companies like yourself or NGOs like yourself are doing is to really bring awareness that this is um, still this has survived. You know the chainsaw. This has survived. You know uh, the, the the imperatives of capitalism to continue. You know finding really good quality product for the for for the marketplace and and you know when you look at the canopy behind you and your picture that's that's first growth and that has beautiful trees that have taken centuries to become what they are and if you look at the picture that we're showing right now that's second growth so that's a garden those are all exactly the same height they're exactly the same diameter and they're being harvested so that's no longer someone once mentioned if you're a deer and it was a, a, Har a harley rep said right. in his book uh, you know big lonely dud you know, if you're a deer and you walk out of a biodiverse forest and by mistake walk into one of these, you know, uh, kind of monoculture, the like Douglas fir forest, you, you better be packing a lunch because there's nothing to eat underneath that canopy because yeah. it's not natural for canopy to all go up at once. And it blocks out all light and source of light for biodiversity to exist. So squirrels, birds, you know, um, you know, can, can, can survive in there. But not a lot of uh, ground creatures can't can't if you can't be in the treetops, you're kind of cooked. You can't you can't go in there and survive. So 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 though so now I'd say you would probably know better, but I would at least half, if not two thirds of of, of uh, Vancouver Island is second growth. Yeah. Uh, and, and they'll be planting third growth, you know, where this cut is, there will be third growth being planted there. And if I've also, you know, I've looked at this too and 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 uh, in Germany, where they've gone past third growth, where they've gone to like fourth growth, it doesn't it doesn't take so well. The, the nutrients are depleted. Um, you know, the trees aren't very healthy. So there's a there are there are limits to how much you can take out of that soil structure before you know the the the, the growths stop growing. Well, yeah, there's something about uh, just failing to recognize that you know the next generation of soil is actually the kind of the the kind of natural kind of death and decay cycle of a living forest ecosystem. Uh, when you load all of the wood onto the back of a truck and ship it off, you kind of negate that. But I can see that they're moving us on to the next uh, to the next image, which I think this is such an incredibly powerful uh, image. And it, as you know, at the heart of Canopy's work is our focus on um, transforming unsustainable supply chains. And supply chains don't necessarily sound sexy, um, but they are responsible for, you know, 80, 88% of the climate and biodiversity uh, impacts associated with a product. So oftentimes your work has been, I think, described as the landscapes of late capitalism, um, tracing supply chains and our consumer culture from, you know, extraction right through to disposal and we have a couple of shots of that coming up but um, this shot in particular and or other landscapes that you've photographed have um, 
you know, are there ones that have had kind of like more profound effects on you than others? Well, this, this landscape, it's interesting because I, um, I had worked uh, in Sudbury for quite some time. And, um, and then I, at the very end of some work I did in the mid 80s, I um, asked the, uh, it was the head, chief geologist who had just recently retired, who became my uh, tour guide. Mm -hmm. And so he was giving me the whole geological history of the, and what happened there and the meteor impact the theory and how all the mines were set up on the edges of, the, of that meteor impact where a lot of the, 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 the molten lava and magma that would be coming out from the edges from that impact was where all the mineralization occurred and that's where all the mines are and so I was kind of learning all this history of, of where nickel and copper and how it's created and realized I had a realization that you know you know my my car is a result of a, a, a of a devastating impact of a meteor on the planet you know you know a long time ago um, and now I'm having the benefit of all those mineral minerals on the edges of that impact that are uh, allowing you know the, the 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 carbon or the copper coils to be built around my alternator and the uh, steel for my car and all that so there was really uh, you know a fascinating learning but when you mine you know it, it's only like a small percentage maybe less than five percent is is actually the the valuable good with the right. copper the nickel that ends up being extracted right yeah the 95 percent is the rock that it all sits in you know, and that doesn't have value. And there are two types of tailings. There are dry tailings and there are wet tailings. And they're both, neither of them are benign. Dry tailings are still highly mineralized, lots of sulfur, lots of, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, dangerous things, you know, as well. Arsenic mm -hmm. could be on it as well. And when you put all that broken faceted rock in a pile and just leave it there, well, when it rains, you know, all that facet, faceted rock is, is leaching out and is going into the, into the groundwater. So dry tailings are, are maybe less vulnerable or less volatile, but they still aren't benign. Wet tailings are more dangerous because there's a high concentration of mineralization in there too. And, and, and especially in, 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 um, in gold mining, there's arsenic and cyanide and there are other things that are in, in, in the tailings. But also there's also chemicals that they, they need to kind of facilitate the extraction of copper, nickel, and all those things. So they have to put all that material somewhere. So when you, if you've ever driven by Sudbury, there's this big, huge, almost 70 meter wall on your right or on the north side of the Trans-Canada Highway. That's where I was. I'm on top of that. That's the tailings pond. And within a century, it's 70, 70 you know, meters high, but it's a 6,000 acre tailings pond that's just slowly moving up. So if you look in the back of this picture, right, and you'll see that there are birch trees, but you can see the tailings are halfway up the birch trees. So these, like when you walk in that forest, I took some pictures, it's the treetops sticking out of the tailings. So it's slowly filling with all of these tailings. And hmm. in this orange is the fact that in all the mining, the, the precious metals and it were nickel, copper, some other precious metals like like you know uh, silver uh, gold some palladium so some, there are other but by and large but there's also iron ore but iron ore wasn't at a level that made it viable to extract it so they just flowed it back out so the iron oxide was flowed back out so effectively these are rivers of rust and maybe future generations will mine these tailings for, you know, for being able to clean up more of it, but it will also be full of iron because they did not capture the iron. It wasn't uh, economically feasible. So they just flowed the iron back into the, land, the, the tailings ponds. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's all a little mind boggling, which we're talking about mind boggling, here's another, here's another landscape. So this one's a little further afield. This is in Malaysia um, mm -hmm. and as opposed to in the Amazon, where deforestation is largely driven for leather production and, and the raising of cattle, uh, you know, here in, in Canada, um, as well as um, in Indonesia, there's a lot of uh, forest fragmentation and loss uh, driven by pulp, pulp and paper industry. Um, and then in Malaysia and Indonesia, there's also the additional driver of, of palm oil. Um, when you kind of first, and this is obviously a, a bird's eye view, um, but 
you know, with this kind of a landscape, um, you know, like when you first saw it, were there kind of like, is there anything that kind of particularly surprised you? Uh, things that other landscapes that you photographed that, you know, you couldn't have previously imagined? Well, I mean, when you see something like this, uh, and there's, um, and, and the thing is that you're just seeing a small little frame I, of it. I have, like I have flying, flown yeah. over hours and hours in Indonesia. Yeah, landscape so you're looking that looks at, like this. you know, yeah, you're looking at the the the, the, the cuticle on the baby tool of the elephant. Yeah. Um, you know, um, the and elephant that once lived in this natural forest, but no longer it. does. Yeah, and so when you see that line at the back edge, you know, that is untouched, unspoiled tropical rainforest. And and when you look, when you fly over and then you walk amongst it, you see that that you know, on the right it's 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 a little more progressed. On the left, it's just been cut, so it's a little so the green, the right is a little bit more green, and, and the left is still so the left is more recently cut. So you, if you if you look at that carefully in the print you see that there are just all the big trees lying on their sides. On the right, the trees have been taken out and now they're planting the palm trees. So this is kind of like different stages. The, the, the pristine in the background, on your right, you've already got some palm trees starting. Mm -hmm. On the left, you know, you've got the degraded forest that's all been cut down in preparation to plant the palm trees. So that in a way, this image shows three stages of, of, of uh, the, the transformation of a, of, of a tropical rainforest into a palm plantation. And again, palm, palm oil, it, it, it's like, it can only really be grown like one from the equator, one latitude in either direction. So there's a really, and it has to be high precipitation, precipitation area. So if it's, you know, it's not going to work in the Sahara Desert, put it that way. Um, but so you need these particular island nations where there's lots of precipitation from the oceans. And so you need tropical rainforests uh, and you need to be within one latitude north or south. And that's why the pressure on these tropical forests are, are, are so intense. Particularly intense. Yeah. Intense, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and again, if you look at palm oil, it's, you know, go to the grocery store and flip it around and it's hard to find a product that doesn't have it. So the, the and of course now with, you know, with what's happened in, in, in the Ukraine and sunflower oil and other oils and all the agriculture and the, and the, and the fertilizers that are being kind of uh, caught up uh, in the supply chain, as you mentioned earlier, the, the pressures of exporting this oil, are no, you know, they're not exporting it now. It, 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 there's, there's a lot of lockdown of, you know, people preserving, you know, their own kind of need right now. So there is a, we're in the middle also of a, of a supply chain Kind of disruption uh, as well. So, so there is there is um, a kind of but seeing that in Malaysia, uh, you know, which is on the island of Borneo, um, it was um, a kind of a to me a wake up call of, of 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 that you know this biodiversity is is being heavily uh, leaned into you know for palm oil and uh, and again uh, no easy answers but but awareness is certainly an important thing to 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 bring people's attention to this. Yeah, I think awareness as well as canopy works to protect uh, uh, alongside our lo local NGO partners a remarkable kind of rainforest area in northern Sumatra, which is right across uh, the strait. Uh, from Borneo. Um, it's called the Loser Ecosystem. Um, and to really, to, you know, to secure durable conservation, it needs to be socially durable. And so just the importance of providing alternative revenue uh, streams, a kind of a conservation-based economy. Um, so alternatives to industrialized supply chains is really critical. And so that's, that's part of the body of work that we're doing in the Loser Ecosystem. So that Hopefully it doesn't end up like this. Mm -hmm. um, if we move to the next uh, slide, which is part of the, I think coming full circle around supply chains, uh, you've done quite a bit of your uh, work uh, looking at recycling at grand scales, uh, like this landfill in, in Nairobi. Um, and, you know, I think you've even been quoted as saying that recycling and putting things back into the system can be humanity salvation. We definitely feel that at Canopy, next-gen solutions uh, are a big priority for us in diversifying the fiber basket so that we're less reliant on raw materials and, and forest fiber. Um, 
how you know like with being on the ground in these areas with these huge kind of landfills which obviously have secondary impacts associated with them um, how do you feel about kind of moving uh, to these kind of more circular uh, systems? Well, I do feel like um, it was actually in the middle of the 90s where I um, coined a, a term for a, a bigger project, a bigger idea that I was working on in that I realized that for the previous 15 years, uh, from the early 80s to mid 90s, I was photographing primary uh, resource extraction, you know, in nature, where 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 the mines or the forests, where all that, were were taking um, materials for for our uh, supply chains. And then I realized that, you know, there is an industrial urban uh, way in mining of mining as well. I called it urban mines. Yeah. And so that you know things like metals and plastic with with plastics that have you know strong carbon chains that can go into the system multiple times um, and continue having the strength and durability um, as well as like you know as we know the metals you know aluminum in particular aluminum someone once told me aluminum is just electricity in a frozen form you know it takes so much electricity to to create it comes out of electricity but what's yeah but once you have it as aluminum you know, you can melt it and reuse it thousands of times. It's it, right. it can, it's an endless kind of this. It, it's a material that keeps on giving, mm -hmm. um, as does iron, as is copper, as is gold, as is any of these you know precious metals. You know, they're they're um, able to go back into the system indefinitely, and so this kind of uh, understanding the the the, the full cycle uh, is part of our salvation, I think, because because the more we do that the less we need to go to the primary source. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what the, the less we go to the forest, less we go to the land, less we push, you know, roads, you know, into the forest, which changes those forests forever. And so, you know, these valley systems where the, the, the typical thing is to blast the top, especially the Canadian Shield, blast the top into the valley, valley, put a couple of culverts in there, put the road over top and, but you changed a, a flow of animals and, you know, insects and fish and, and everything is no longer the same you've just in ways disrupted. that we don't even understand no we, we've just yeah. but we've really messed them up mm -hmm. you know um and so it isn't just the fact that it's there it's getting there that's half the problem too and then once you get a road there then of course hunters and fishermen and you know foragers and whatever and then the human impact starts to go further and further into these places so so at the end of the day, I mean, anything that stops us from having to go to the primary source right now, to me, is positive. So recycling is definitely part of that. It's so recycling and conservation and, you know, choosing not to use plastic bottles, but to use a can to drink water so that you're not adding, you know, a couple hundred bottles of plastic bottles a year into the system that you don't need to. Uh, because again, it's still energy being used when you have to recycle it. So the idea is to recycle the things that need to be recycled and right. that we need, you know, um, that, you know, I, I don't see it easier, a better, you know, than a plastic container. If you have leftover food for tomorrow, then you can get glass or you can be plastic, but it's, you know, it is a pretty useful tool. Um, so, so it's kind of trying to, you know, keep ourselves conscious of, of the fact that you know we're trying to you know maximize you know our clothing forward maximize our materials that we're using minimize what goes into the waste stream and what goes into the recycling stream i mean these are all kind of things as, as individuals we all have opportunities to to improve and we all need to improve i i i still have to find things in my life that i, I need to get to get better as well don't don't we all but I, I think we're really struck by how waste is a completely human construct. In nature, there's no such thing as waste, right? Like it's all part of a perpetual cycle. And yet humanity has this sensibility of things being able to be tossed away where they are perfect for the next iteration of guttering or the next vehicle or next season's clothing or packaging. 
Um, it's anyway, so, so it's persistent. It's a persistent carbon change. I, I have a great, it's kind of interesting insight that I had. And back in 1981 was my first time to Asia, and I was in Thailand, and I was in northern Thailand, Chiang Mai, and they had just gone away from. If you bought like a bit of rice, you'd have it on a in a, a banana a banana, leaf. a banana leaf, and you'd have, yeah. and then all of a sudden, packaged goods were there, and these little shops. And then they just noticed that they would throw the plastic on the ground because they would throw the banana leaf on the ground and it would become the next banana tree or yep. whatever, you know, and here they're throwing plastic thinking that it's going to go away and it doesn't. Yeah. And they just or don't that know. the and oxen then, would eat it or it yeah. biodegrades it, in the patty and it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't biodegrade. So all of a sudden you're just seeing all this collection in the corners of these little villages of plastic and you're going, that's it. These carbon chains are persistent and they don't break down. And that's why, um, you know, they're, they're, they're dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, I think if folks have questions, please post them. Um, uh, I have one more question for you, Ed, and then we'll kind of pop over to, to folks. Um, so this shot is from Cathedral Grove, which is a really kind of beautiful uh, pocket of old growth uh, in uh, kind of like the degraded landscape at a whole of, of Vancouver Island. Um, and so, I think for me, when I find uh, solace and inspiration uh, in landscapes, natural landscapes, um, I'm just cognizant of you know the conversation that we've had, the intensity of the imagery, and the times that we're in. Be it you know with the recent U.S. Uh, court decision, climate change, war, uh, and your pieces are generally so intensely focused on impact. Um, how how do you balance being immersed in the reality of supply chains and you know needing to get out of bed every day or you know how do you hope that your images and films will have influence well i think you know if you if you look at the whole like the in the wake of progress and, and if you kind of see the it's, it's a it's a complete arc of my work you know so it goes right from early landscapes where I started in the late 70s and early 80s, just the, the pristine landscape and then the altered landscapes and the deforestation and, 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 and the logging and the lumber industries and on and on and on and, and the you know, container ports and, and, and infrastructure and highways and refineries and all, all the things that I've looked at over a 40 year period are all kind of strung together in this, you know, 20 minute piece. And, and it's a, it's a piece that I'm trying to get, people to reflect upon but in that what you see in there too if you're watching is that there's an incredible amount of human ingenuity that's also on display you know how we build these cities and how we make these things and how we you know supply for eight billion people and so i want to believe that if we all appreciate that there's a real problem here we can apply that ingenuity to help solve the problem that it's really the it's not the fact that we don't have all the things around us that can solve the problem the solutions are just lying around about they just need to be picked up and implemented we know what we have to do it's just we need to just get on with it and do it and there, I, I think that the fastest way to get on with it and do it is when you use in late stage capitalism, but when you use the tools of capitalism, in other words, mm -hmm. incentivize the behavior we want and disincentivize the behavior we don't. And governments can do that and, and probably quicker than anybody else through taxation and incentive programs, you can actually shift. You know, I think there should be a, a bottom, you know, there, there should be a bottom price to a barrel of oil, no matter what, even if the market, if, even if the market says go lower, don't go below 60 or 70, because it kills all those green startups. And I've seen it happen twice now. Yeah. And, you know, you, you got to protect or at least go protect those startups. If oil says, OK, now it's cheaper to buy, you know, a big, you know, diesel truck versus an electric car because, you know, gas is so cheap again, you know, and, and we've seen it happen time and again. And so you kill a whole generation of entrepreneurship trying to find the right solution by, by just having the price of gas go down to $20 a barrel. And all of a sudden your pump is 50 cents and it looks great and consumers love it, but you've just set us, you've just set back a green revolution another decade or so. Yeah. So I think it's really, you know, how do we, and so we need to incentivize, we need to, and, and I think in corporations, and, and I think you're doing it is that we need 
to actually, they need to think about how to make it easier for us to do the right thing. Because I can't go to the grocery store and start taking everything out of plastic packages and putting it into something more sustainable. You know, they look at me and say, go leave the store, yeah. right? I mean, right. so, you know, so you have to, we yeah. have to find a way to have everybody kind of designers, you know, retailers, as you're saying, and packaging is critically important, all sitting there, how do we do this? And, you know, um, not destroy, you know, all kinds of, you know, natural systems in the process of, of, of this. So, I did that. so it is a real challenge and it's a big design problem. And, uh, um, you know, and I think that, you know, the, I think companies are stepping up to it. I just hope it does, that that momentum doesn't slow down. Yeah, I think that, I mean, leveraging the, the tools of capitalism are definitely at the core of our work and our model of change and just really kind of leveraging the influence and, and the reach that brands can have not only upstream through supply chains, but to incentivize governments to step in and take bold action as well. Because uh, yeah. I think oftentimes that why we're grappling with the severity of the situation we are is because there's been a daft of imagination and a daft of courage to actually really step in and grapple with it. But there's nothing like a, a deadline uh, to incentivize us. So we have a question that's come in um, from Andy, who voices his appreciation for for your kind of like all of your work and for this discussion. Um, and he's uh, wondering what's next for your photography, which is kind of a nice segue over actually. I mean, maybe you want to talk more broadly. And then we well, can talk. My, my, my kind of my what's next right now uh, is, um, you know, taking this whole new form. So, so in the wake of progress is, is, is a new way of bringing out my ideas. And, and, and it's, I think, a, 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 and, and the films, you know, point to that direction too, where you, when you watch a film around the environment or whatever, and, if, and, and, and particularly what Jennifer, Nick and myself try to do is, that you get invested in the in the journey with us. You you go on that journey, and it has emotional moments, and and you really end up feeling that there's something here. There's something that we need to pay attention to. There's something that is hitting me on a level that 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 you know I, I want to do something about it. I want to motivate, and I think that um, the visual arts and photography and film are particularly powerful tools in in the telling of this story. Um, and because it's evidence based, it, it's uh, these are these are the landscapes that are that exist in our time. They may look totally surreal, but they are our landscapes. Yeah, you know, we're working at this scale. So, so it's taking that kind of taking those ideas and having people kind of have an emotional experience with them, and to and that and that in that emotional experience, it can kind of move up into our you know intellectual beings, you know, we, we mm -hmm. can start to own those things in a different way, because I, because when you feel so you can read an IPCC report, but you know, you're not going to, it's not going to bring tears to your eyes. No, we, no. and we don't take action based on what we know, right? Like we, we take action and we go that extra yard because of what we feel connected to what we yes. love. Yeah. And I think until we feel that the big loser in this game right now is the natural world. And that this is not a small thing because the natural world uh, from which we have sprung from is our habitat. <laughs> that is our habitat. And we're destroying our nat the natural habitat of what we used to live in. You know, it, because of technology, we're now, we're now we, we, we've created our metropolises. That's now our habitat. But that's not our natural. Most of our, uh, you know, our existence as humans has been in nature, not in these cities. Yeah. And so now we're just going to that place that we used to exist in and coexist with and shredding it. So, um, and I think we're doing it with impunity. And I think if we don't get with the program and understand that we're connected to that, if that collapses, we're, we're not in good shape. We don't have a... We don't have a lot of stuff in our toolkit that can fix the problem. Um, you know, we think we might, and that's an arrogant position, but uh, I think it's best not to watch a lot of extinction happen. And, 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 you know, whether it's trees or whether it's plant life or whether it's animal life or microbial life, you know, all of them are play 
play a role in, in, in a healthy ecosystem. So it, it is something that I, you know, I think we're, you know, if I can, if you could, if the new work I'm doing can actually make people feel that, 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 that there's, that what's being lost is, is nature, our natural world. And, and that we shouldn't think of that as a trivial problem. It's yeah. not. No, it is. It's the trivial. It's the, it's the, it's the problem of our time and, and the kind of potentially the, well, the defining struggles of our time, right? Um, I know that we're, we have, we do have a couple of other questions, but we're coming right up on time. So um, maybe if you can, um, I think one of the questions actually works quite well with where I was hoping that we could um, kind of go as we wrap up this session. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, in the wake of progress, uh, you know, how it was, how it was conceived, the origin story behind it, um, and the launch and how people can access it. Yeah, so it, it, uh, back in, um, I think it was 2018, Naomi Campbell, uh, who's the artistic director for Illuminato, approached me by email and said, would you be interested in if, I, if you could do a takeover all the screens in Dundas Square? And then I was interested, and then we set up a meeting of the following year for the festival for 2020. And she said, "Okay, I got a budget. I've got this. I've got that. I think we can get the screens." And so she said, "Do okay, go ahead, do whatever you want. You got all 22 screens for three hours a night, you know." And 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 I said, "Has ever been done before?" And she said, "No. I think it's the first time. There's eight different companies that own those screens." And you have to color correct them and density correct them. And I said, "Wow, this is a huge kind of technological." Kind of pretzel to un, un pretzel to try and make this happen but she said we'll figure that out you, you you go ahead and work on something so i thought well what do i do with that and then and then it was like a you know carte blanche what do what do i do and i thought putting it putting something to music something like hmm. something where you can stand for 20 minutes in a square and i wanted to think okay here's a person leaving eaton center nordstrom's or whatever with their latest purchase and they've got a bag and they're walking across the square and all of a sudden they encounter this you know, music with the with all the screens as uh, telling that person with a bag in their hand, this is why you get the shop. This city came from these places. These the thing in your bag came from places like this in China. It, so I wanted to have it as a kind of a feedback loop mm -hmm. to the unaware consumer in a public square. So it was so so it was conceived as a work as a public square. And then COVID happened. So I couldn't do it in the summer, June of 2020, and I had an extra year. So then I said, well, this actually thing, I think this would work as, a, as an indoor experience, as a surround immersive indoor experience. And I was watching how successful places like, you know, you know things like Van Gogh and you know, Klimt and all these things were, you know, getting people out to, to, to have seen the mm -hmm. latest in projection technologies. So I said, I'm going to project my work high resolution in a really surround way. And then going to take that and, and design the whole piece there and then take that to the square and break it out into the square. Mm -hmm. So it started me editing for the square and then I went into the interior and indoor experience. And, and then, so it's only on Saturday that, uh, so two weeks ago, two weekends ago, we played in the square and it was exciting yeah. to thousands of people. And it was exactly that effect. And people were taken, people were like, whoa, you know, I had no idea. And the music was really powerful as well. So now we're, we've taken it to the indoor experience at the COC, and it's a big open space. It's, it's 80 feet wide by 120 feet, 60 foot ceilings. And then when I first saw it, I went, this is where I want to do it. I saw it three years ago. I said, I can see the three screens there. And it had something very poetic about the location that mm -hmm. used to be the coal storage for the city. Oh, so, it's like a so source to plowshares. Yeah. That's right. So all of a sudden, it's like this place that was supporting the city with coal and fuel for decades and decades. It was built in the late 1800s. So, so now, you know, we opened that up this weekend and it's up for three weeks, but, and everybody had seen it, it has had a very profound kind of immersive sound and, and Phil Strong, you know, did the composition for it, a beautiful job at it. Bob Ezrin of Legend, you know, is a producer and also worked on, the, on, on make, making sure the sound was, was as good as it could be. So it is quite, um, I think a, a, a remarkable kind of coming in and, I, and I'm, I'm having a hard time when people leave to say, did you enjoy it? 
I'm not sure if that's the right question. Right. I'm saying, you know, how did you find it? <laughs> Maybe, or did that? How did that affect you? Or what? Or what did you feel when you went through it? I don't think enjoy is the right word, but to be kind of, uh, it's not. I don't think it's meant to be enjoyed. It's meant to be considered. I want people to stand there and think about what I just showed you, and, and really go back and really evaluate your own thoughts and your own ways and which you do things. And, and I always said that the, the two great tools that both that all of us have in a democracy is our wallet and our vote. And, and we really need to kind of uh, exercise those exercise with, both of them, both of them carefully. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the things that I always find so powerful about your work as well as other artists is, is that ability to really go in and touch people there's an intensity to the experience it's not always about enjoyment but it's the in feeling an intense emotion uh and then that leading to a shift in the way that we view the way that we think about things and, and that's partly why i'm so appreciative of your contribution to the space i i think we could continue to, this conversation for a long long time and next time we'll just have to schedule a six hour <laughs> session with you ed um but i am conscious that we're at the top of the hour and in fact a little over now um so i want to thank you for being so incredibly generous uh as well as i think one of the things that really strikes me is that you know we're trained uh to value things in life we're trained to value artwork and you know, including many of your photographs they're prized uh they're thought of as priceless um uh, but there are things in our world that are truly irreplaceable, um, old growth forests, wild river systems. Um, and I really want to thank you, Ed, for the body of work that you've done in really bringing that into focus with your work, that there are these landscapes and that nature is irreplaceable um, through a medium that people often place a lot of value on. Um, and your continued contributions to the conservation movement, to our natural world, are just uh, incredibly powerful. So just a personal thanks. It's been an incredible honor and pleasure to have this conversation with you. Um, and I want to thank everybody else for joining us um, and being so generous in sharing kind of this hour of your day uh, with us. And if you don't already, please add Canopy to your socials. We're easy to find at, at Canopy Planet also, of course. Uh, please add Ed uh, to your uh, social channels as well. And keep an eye out for our next Tree Talks event, which will be in the fall. So stay tuned. Thanks so much, Ed. Thanks, Nicole.